Hey everybody, welcome back. Uh, as promised, uh, I'm doing a video here today in regards to the wall, the border wall construction, and some of the issues with the Mexico-United States border in the area of Lukeville, Arizona. So to start off, we're, it, this all pretty much came to a head when my wife and I left Phoenix, which we're back in Phoenix now. But we left Phoenix uh, a, from a house sit there and headed to Oregon Pipe uh, National Monument. Now, nor Oregon Pipe is just uh, north of the Mexican border, south of Ajo, Arizona. Uh, but Oregon Pipe National Monument was a pretty good stepping off point uh, to go to a town called Lukeville. Arizona, which is right on the Mexican-United States border, about seven miles to the south of that. And when we decided we were going to go take a look at the wall that was being constructed in that area, uh, we found out that there was a road called Porto, Porto Blanco Drive that goes from Lukeville, or it's just, just before you get into the town of Lukeville, and it heads west on the north side of the wall. Now that that is a road that for a ways it's pretty much right next to the same access road that the border patrol agents use and now the construction folks are using right alongside the wall. And there's some instances where it peels away and then comes back down in. But it's a pretty good wall to get or a pretty good road for you know, just ordinary citizens to drive down to kind of get a look at, at the wall. Uh, the secondary reason that we went down that road was at the end of the road, there's a place called uh, Quito Baquito Springs, which is a real cool natural spring right out in the middle of, the, uh, you know, the desert, as it were, the Sonoran Desert. But that, I'll, I'll address that in another video that we're going to do about Oregon Pipe National Monument and our experience there. So that'll be a a separate video. So before we get further into this, let's go ahead and show you some clips of us taking a drive down there and then uh, I'll get into some of the the narration of some of the questions and answers I got after you see some of the, the clips. So take a look at the clip here. So we're on basically uh, the border road that goes from Lukeville up to Quito Benito um, so we're going to get some shots of the wall. We talked to a Border Patrol agent today and we talked to some Park Service people today and uh, also looked into some Mexican insurance as well. So we're going to be touching on all those subjects. But so the deal is if you're in the United States and we're here in, in Lukeville, uh, Arizona, and just considering going over into Mexico, even going a couple of miles to get a taco or whatever, you have to have insurance to go in there. And if you don't have insurance and you're stopped over there for whatever reason, uh, they basically can take whatever cash you have. If you had $300 in cash on you, you're, you're going to hand that over. If you had $200, you are going to hand it. So it's best to always get some kind of insurance before you go over there. So full coverage, uh, comprehensive and liability to go into Mexico is in this vehicle, the Tiger Adventure vehicle is $38 a day. So <clears throat> we were only gonna go a couple of miles, have a taco and come out. Those would but, be pretty expensive tacos. Yeah, so I don't, I don't think we're gonna do it. And, you know, it's just, the other, the other thing is we do have somebody back in camp. We don't know how they got sick and if they if they got sick just coming down here to get something to eat or something or water. I don't want to. It's not like we're we're set up to be able to go run to the hospital or something. So we're gonna we're gonna. That's not the major reason, but yeah, thirty eight dollars for a couple of tacos is kind of expensive. I don't care how good they are. Okay. Well. So we're down here at the port of entry, and uh, we're gonna go check out maybe some of the walls somewhere else. We, one of the Border Patrol agents told us not to go down one road and maybe we're going to search out another road and, and at another time. 
and see how that goes. So. Okay, then. Right. The truck is running in the background, so you might have to speak up a little bit. So why don't you tell everybody what we're we're planning on doing so here? So right now we're about right here. Yep. And we are going to drive out here on South Puerto Blanco Drive. Yeah, so this is the U.S.-Mexican border. Yep, then yep. we'll drive along there. We can either go up here to Sanita Basin. Yep. Or we can keep driving along the border wall and come up here to Quito Biquito, which yeah. is where I think I'd like to go. Yeah. Supposedly there's a nice wet area up there. Yeah. It could be some good birding. Okay. So I think that's what we're going to try to do. All right, it's let's... about 15 miles. Okay, let's do it. Here's a, here's a look at it. Uh, uh, basically, it goes as far as the eye can see in either direction as a construction. I got some construction vehicles coming now, so I'm gonna leave, but I'll try to get some broader footage of it. Uh, so you can see, and we're gonna actually have a, a sort of some dash cam video as well. Uh, but there, it's it's definitely in progress. same guy we talked to before. substantial I mean so I know somebody said something about you know it was the wind could blow it over I really doubt it Okay, so you had a chance to look at the, uh, the clips. What I'm gonna do now is pretty much read uh, a transcript that I wrote uh, based on a couple of interviews that I did with some of the personnel down here in uh, Arizona. And it, like, three different encounters, two of which were pretty extensive. One was sort of a random on the fly. Uh, it'll be two border patrol agents and one Park Ranger. I did interview a, another Border Patrol agent last year at the Lost Mabel State Park in Texas. Uh, she was a Border Patrol agent that converted to a Park Ranger and she worked in the either the Nogales area or the San Diego area, I can't remember which. But I'm not going to include her in some of this because th I already wrote about that. There wasn't any inconsistencies from what she said to what these guys said, so it would just be redundant. Uh, so we're going to take it one step at a time. I'm going to read the question, talk to you a little bit about the who I'm talking to first, and then we'll get on to the questions and answers. So let's go. All right, so the first guy that we talked to was a Border Patrol agent at the beginning of Puerto Blanco Drive. 
Now, if you saw in the clip me freeze frame a truck driving by, we actually saw him again later uh, as we were driving through there. So it was the same guy we talked to. He definitely works the wall. He knows what he's talking about. He's been there for a while. Uh, but the first time we encountered him, this was the first question I asked him. I said, hi, my wife and I are camping at Oregon Pipe. We came down today to drive along the wall. Is that okay? And if so, can I ask you a couple of questions? And he said that was fine. Uh, he said, sure, what can I help you with? He said, so my wife and I are from back east. We're just not sure we're getting on an accurate picture as to what's happening here. Is the media accurate in regards to what's happening here? His response was, not entirely. In fact, from our vantage point, our meeting the Border Patrol agent, maybe his co-workers, etc., we're a bit confused, primarily because they keep reporting on what's happening here as if they're actually here, and they are not. So I don't know where they're getting their information from, but it's generally not accurate. Me. One of the things I hear frequently is the family separation aspect, children being separated from their families. Is that accurate? Well, he said yes and no. So I asked him to expand on that. He said, first of all, the majority of the children, uh, if I can read my writing, that get separated at the border are not members of the supposed family they are with. So they are actually technically getting separated from their family before they get to the border. Meaning that their the families obviously take these kids, however, and they get separated from the families and they're given to people to take them across, etc. Sometimes they're related, sometimes they're not. But here's the caveat. He said many times that the children that are sold by the cartel are done so to strangers that are of no family relationship or relationship whatsoever to the, the kids involved uh, in an effort to get the, the people, adults, across the border and processed in a more uh, in a faster fashion so in other words there's some sort of program that the cartels have set up so they take a kid they'll buy kids or they'll take kids from families or whatever and they'll put them with people that they want to get across the border thinking that'll help the processing of them getting through the process whether it's illegal or otherwise uh, um, he talked about uh, other kids coming across again when they do get separated at the border and they are related it's only because they get related they get separated until the, the, the border patrol people can verify that the adults that they are with are in fact their parents and this is only as a uh, the only reason they're doing this like this is because most of the time the kids are not and they have no relation to the adults they have no relation family wise friends nothing they're just they're just strangers uh, so herein lies a big problem so if you can see one of the big problems already as I said to him what what are the biggest problems on the border and he says presently human trafficking and drug uh, smuggling so then we got away from the human trafficking for a minute and I got on the drug side of it and said, well, drugs like weed. He said, no, there is some weed, but the two drugs, the two big drugs are fentanyl and meth. Ironically, as I found out from him, fent uh, fentanyl <laughs> is legal in Mexico. And if you don't know what fentanyl is, look it up. It's pretty ugly. Uh, so. I said to him, what is your feeling about the wall? Good thing, bad thing? He said, you know, before I was assigned here, I didn't really have a position on it. But being here, seeing what happens here every day, the pressure from the Mexican cartel, uh, even if I wasn't with the Border Patrol Agency, I would be for it. There are two problems. One, I think, for this work is, is to work effectively. It has to be complete. Crossings will still occur where the wall isn't built. As you'll see, there are gaps even along this, this section. Uh, those are due to some engineering issues, which I'll touch on later. But the Indian Reservation to the east, that also borders Mexico, is not covered. That's where the drugs and trafficking will go if they can't get across anywhere else, and that might create some issues for the reservation. Reservation is a big issue because it's a sovereign area. 
Uh, technically, you're not supposed to go in there. We're not supposed to have any rights there. We're not supposed to enforce anything there. They're supposed to be their own deal. So I'm not, I'm not very clear as to what, what uh, the federal government's stand can be there, if any. Uh, but we'll get into it a little bit more later. Me, you mentioned the cartel. Can you expand on that? The agent, the cartel run everything, the drugs, the human trafficking, everything. If you cross the border, it has to be through the cartel, especially if you're a Mexican citizen. You can get in a lot of trouble as a Mexican citizen if you try to do it on your own, especially if you're caught and sent back. They could put pressure on your family. And I asked him what kind of pressure, and he's talking like breaking legs, you know, or worse. Okay, one of my regrets here was not asking him ab about other immigrants other than Mexican citizens about how, for instance, that applies to South Americans of any kind, whether or not, you know, how do they put pressure on somebody's family back in South America, and that kind of deal. Um, I asked him, it has been reported in the news that the wall is a joke, that a good stiff wind could blow it over. Is this true? Is it not robust enough? Uh, his answer was, it's plenty strong and well placed. There are some problem areas that I've heard that engineers have, but it doesn't have anything to do with the wind. And I'll allude to that later. Uh, and that has to do with the gaps. At the end of the discussion, he told me he appreciated my interest in the matter and we said goodbye. They're very, very uh, happy to talk to me. I was, they were very approachable. I was very surprised how open they were about all of this. Uh, so the next individual was a park service law enforcement ranger that was within our park. So he's basically a ranger, park ranger. Carried a gun, you know, whole deal. Uh, I'm not sure that his, this title, uh, his job title was entirely accurate and I'll get into why. Uh, so he came to our campsite basically to see our trailer and he dropped in and he thought it was pretty cool. So I showed him around the trailer. So then I was like, hey, can I ask you a question or two before you go? So here we go. So can I ask you a couple of questions before you go? Sure. Do you think the media gives a fair portrayal as to what is going on regarding the Mexico border on the border wall? His response, wow, gee, uh, probably not. I mean, it tends to be more po a political viewpoint rather than what really is happening down here. So then I said, so what do you think is the, one of the biggest things that the news media seems to be getting wrong? And he said, so hard to choose. Well, for starters, they don't seem, seem to see the drug trafficking that's happening here. Then of course, there is the human trafficking. Yeah, the human trafficking we see here is off the charts and it's kind of, and it's the kids mainly. That's one thing I didn't really expect, all the kids. So I said, well, what do you mean? I, he's, I could t and I could tell at this point he's pretty upset. Like he had just gone from being pretty happy-go-lucky, we're talking about our our rig and our lifestyle, and then I start talking about this whole, his job, and and in particular about the the kids and how they're in the whole drug of uh, the trafficking thing, and he and his mood just turned uh, to pretty sad. And it's making me sad to think about it because I I was the one who watched him. I could just tell his face turning. So he said, the one thing that I didn't really expect, all the kids. He said, what do you, I said, what do you mean? He said, all the kids that you see on this job, the cartel selling kids to people so that it might help them get over the border easier. The cartel sort of perpetuates the illusion that if they try, if you try and cross with kids, if you can somehow get a hold of some kids to cross with you, uh, it somehow is easier. Now, when I, I think he meant by easier, so if, if they decide they're just gonna cross, sit down on the road and let the border patrol agents ar arrest them and then process them, it's easier if they have kids or if they're just, you know, it just, if they try to get through legally. I'm, I wasn't quite sure, but either way, it's the whole, whole notion that kids just, just make it easier. The young girls in their teens that are taken across, we just had a group that we arrested crossing there trying to make their way on foot. A 13-year-old girl was raped continuously by several of the men in the group. So when these, when these people come across, and he reiterated this a couple of times, 
that there are, and both of these agents sort of touched on this, that they have no problem with a me Mexican citizen, guy or gal, who are coming into the United States to try to get a job to better their families, legitimately trying to come in here legally. They don't have any problem with that. That's This is not, our our cup is too full, we can't take anywhere. They don't, they don't look at it like that. This has nothing to do with that. But in light of this, he happened to touch on the fact that some, you know, when you get, when you're coming across, not all of these people coming across are good people. Most are not good people. Uh, so he said, we just had a group that we arrested crossing through here trying to make their way on foot to Ajo. Ajo is the town north of the border, which was north of us, uh, where we were at Oregon Pipe. A 13-year-old girl was raped continuously by several of the men in the group. So obviously this family decided they wanted their 13-year-old girl to go across, you know, let her go into this group. The cartel puts her into this group with a bunch of creepy guys. And this is the kind of thing that happens before she, they finally, uh, before the Border Patrol Agency finally found him. And he was pretty shook, shook up about that. I mean, when he was telling that story, that was not a story he could look me in the eye and talk about without, you know, breaking down a little bit. And quite frankly, to repeat, it's not easy either. <clears throat> so we talked a little bit more about it, not a respect for the victims and for him. Uh, I'm not going to, I'm not going to, uh, I'm not going to get into it any more than that. So we shifted gears a little bit. What about the wall? Is it substantial enough to hold up to winds down here? I hear some of these sections are getting blown down over in the wind. His response was, no, from what I've heard, that was a section under construction, more than likely poor installation, but there are a few problems. And I asked him, like what? Well, you said you've been to the wall, and I said yes. Well, the gaps you see in the wall uh, right now are where there are washes. So what they did was, they're putting up the wall, putting up the wall. All of a sudden, they come to a dry creek bed, what we call a wash or arroyo, uh, where a dry creek bed was. Uh, usually, it's just for flash flooding. So what the engineers decide to do is like, well, you really can't put a wall right in the middle of a flash flood uh, dry creek bed because that water comes along. It's going to it's got to go somewhere. So they leave sections out and are trying to figure out what to do with it. Uh, so, and they're afraid that if they do put one in, you know, the water comes down, does some undermining, maybe the wall falls over, creates a, a bigger problem. Uh, but he did say that the higher ups are thinking about leaving the gaps in some areas and putting extra men or sensors in that area. Now, don't forget when the wall is complete, according to these guys, uh, they'll be able to take the checkpoints that are about 50 miles inland from the border all through Arizona and remove some of those personnel away from the checkpoints and beef up the patrols down at the wall. Uh, and of course, improve if they get a little bit more money from Congress. If Congress ever gets off its ass, uh, they might be able to do some electronics to, to, uh, to ensure that too. Uh, me. President Trump stated the wall is an impenetrable, that it cannot be climbed. Is that true? He smiled. The real intent, in my opinion, is that the wall is there to slow things down. So there's no such thing as an impenetrable wall. Some people will be able to climb it, some people won't. I don't see a lot of people dragging tons of bags of drugs and stuff. And you can look all through YouTube, and there's all kinds of crazy... Uh, people putting stuff about how they try to drive cars over it and climb up over it. and there's a couple of guys. Funny thing is there's a, there's a video out there from a news media organization, kind of low on the totem pole. They show these guys zipping right up the wall and right down the other side. Well, the guy gets down on the other side, slides down like he's one of these ops guys. Well, what's waiting for him on the other side is a border patrol agent, so. Uh, so I said, what about the Indian? We talked about the Indian reservation, so we got into that. He said, well, that's a problem. It's a, it's, it is sovereign, and there has been some resistance there. If the wall can't be built there, then that's where the crossings will happen. Path of least resistance. 
there's a lot of migrants crossing there already. It's hard to patrol within the reservation. And I said, so do you do a lot of patrolling yourself? He said, no, half my job is park ranger. So he's there to protect the resources of the park and make sure laws are enforced in the park. Uh, I also patrol the, his other half of his job though, is he, I also patrol the backcountry by whatever means to monitor the impact as a result of a legal activity moving north toward Ajo. Drugs, damage to plants, garbage, drugs, etc. cetera. Uh, I said, is there a lot of that? Oh yeah, bags of drugs, garbage, clothes, black jugs. You know about the black jugs? And I said, no. He said, it's how they transfer water. So black jugs are old motor oil jugs that are black. Uh, they recycle them in Mexico and give the people that cross over them full of water to drink out of them. The reason they're black is they don't want them reflecting any light because they'll be seen easier. So yeah, and you need about a liter of water uh, per hour and 125 degree heat in the middle of July. And as he put it, you just can't carry enough water. So these people are already like one foot in the grave when they start in the summertime. How far do they tend to go once they get across the border? And he said, that depends on what they pay the cartel. Again, the cartel controls everything. You don't cross the border by yourself. Generally speaking, you do it only through the cartel because it's, it's their money, pay the toll. Uh, but the, as it turns out, the cartel has a menu of, of programs. You can pay a little or you can pay a lot. It makes a difference between them just driving you up to the wall, you get out, you try to cross by yourself, they wait as long as, they, and once you're out of sight, they leave. If you go over and a border patrol agent comes, uh, then they run back across the border, get in the car, and you know you try it another day. Or it can be as extravagant as a one-on-one -on -one deal in a car where they drive you right to wherever you're, you wanna go, Ajo is a big destination uh, in that area or Tucson or some place where somebody can pick you up. And any package in between from going over in a group with a coyote to just a one-on-one -on -one with a coyote, oh, whatever. So there's all kinds of different packages. It's just like going to a restaurant and ordering off the menu. Uh, one of the things, so I said to him, I said, like a menu of services, and he said yes. And then he says, then there's the humanitarian aspect that no one ever seems to talk about. He said, there is a group, he named it, but I simply will just say that it's a group probably associated with the University of Arizona, a, bunch of, a group of college students. Uh, that think they are helping by putting out cans of food and water at different meeting spots so the immigrants have food and water. So in other words, uh, people illegally crossing try to go as far as they can through the desert on what they have, but then there's these little caches that they have out in the desert of food and water. Sometimes it's put out there by other Im Im uh, illegal immigrants. Sometimes it's put out by these humanitarian groups. Uh, he said the problem is that it's usually near a road where normally the person say might give up because they don't have any water, they don't have any food, they're really dehydrated, so they just sit down on the road and wait to be picked up. But having these caches there kind of backfires because then an immigrant might be coming through, see it, oh, now I got water, now I got food, and they take it and keep moving even though they're like really in rough shape. They get deeper into the desert and then they perish. Uh, he says, but what ends up happening is now they have food and water, but their bodies might already be in jeopardy and keep moving on and end up dying deeper in the desert. One of our jobs is retrieving bodies, even in the desert. And I said to him, does that happen often? He said, for me, about one to two bodies a month. And he was very upset about that. Uh, from dehydration or exhaustion, he said, probably. Most of the time when we're retrieving the body, there really isn't much left to deter to." Uh, used to determine that. Uh, what can the average person do to help? Are there any programs to volunteer and help secure the border? He said, no, not really, and we really try and discourage it, especially when people come down here on their own. There would be a lot of conflict. As it is, we're starting to see some cloning, which is a problem. Cloning, I asked? He said, last week we discovered one of the yellow construction trucks you see around the construction work sites. Uh, I'm sorry, he said this in a question. 
And I said, yeah, I know the, I know those because there's a lot of these yellow pickups that are used to just zip around the construction sites like you see at a construction or an excavating site at home. They're all the same color. They're sort of like a school bus yellow. They say, south, I believe, southwestern construction on the side. They're the people that evidently have the bid for the wall. And uh, he said, he asked me if I've seen them. I said, like, yeah, I see them all the time. He said, anyway, the cartel clones an almost perfect match of one of these trucks, except it had a hidden compartment under the bed to smuggle drugs across. It looked so much like the real deal that we couldn't tell the difference. It was only when one of the construction workers had just happened to be talking to one of the BP agents at the time that noticed a very small detail about the truck, and he wouldn't tell me what it was. They pulled it over, and sure enough, the truck was a fake. The driver even had a fake ID that looked like the real thing, too. So, uh, yeah. <laughs> so there's that. Uh, so what are some of the other challenges that you have? He said, well, on, off the top of my head, we, have, we usually have at least two scouts in the park all the time. Scouts? Uh, I said, like guides. Uh, I thought he meant that there were two guides doing it at the... See, I thought he, when he at first said scouts that maybe it was like, you know, they're having a hard time managing two of their personnel in the park. But what he meant was that the cartel has two scouts in the park on a place called Twin Peaks, which was a mountain area just north of us in the campground, and which was ironic because wherever you walked in the park, you could see these this mountain. Morning doves are coming in to roost. Cartel makes them stay here and work as scouts on the mountaintop to watch and they get what they do is they go up there with like a week's worth of food or they get supplemented with food however but they have binoculars and spotting scopes and uh and radios so they watch where the rangers are they watch where the border patrol agents are and they can help coordinate people coming across by talking to the cartel on the other side and and other coyotes so wrap your head around that yeah Cartel people in your in your national park sitting there coordinating illegal movement of migrants. I thought that was pretty. That kind of put well when we were there anyway. It really made the hair on the back of my neck stand on end. Um, so what else? Uh, he talked about. Uh, we talked about 20 minutes on other aspects of the wall and immigration that I won't repeat here, as it would be redundant from the first agent. I also want to include the conversation from the Border Patrol agent I spoke to. We talked about that from last year in Texas. Uh, okay, and then we let, so we left Oregon Pipe and headed to Tucson and Route 86. Uh, as you come up out of Route 85 north, we ran into a Border Patrol checkpoint. Then we switched to Route 86 after that and headed east and ran into another checkpoint just outside of Tucson. And there was a lot of Border Patrol agent activity on the road. I, I don't think we probably would go four or five miles and see one coming in the opposite way. We had a couple pass us. We saw a few on the road. The black jugs were everywhere. We could see them on the side of the roads on the way on 86 even. So obviously there's some traffic coming through the reservation to be sure. Um, uh, when we stopped at the second checkpoint, the one that's just outside of Tucson, we spoke to the Border Patrol agent there as quick as we could because there were cars behind us. Uh, he reiterated a couple of things that uh, we talked to the other agents about and also asked him about programs. Uh, they talked about ride-alongs that I guess you can do a couple of weeks a year with them. And I don't know if it's specific to any one particular office, but in any event, if you want to know anything that's going on on the border, you can go to the Border Patrol Agency's website, I believe, and he said that there's a public information section there that you can uh, read notifications about things that are going on there. Okay, so that's a wrap up on the questions and answers. All right. What I'd like to do now is just kind of give my input of it and, and leave it at that. There's been a lot of shootings down there in the last few years, the park itself. The National Monument itself was closed for years because of a murder that took place back in 2002. The Visitor Center at the National Monument has been named after that individual. I'll put his name down here. 
Uh, there was also two Border Patrol agents killed in that altercation. At, at that time, they put up a wall to stop vehicular traffic from coming over the border. Now the cartel's getting smarter and they're doing other things to get people over the... And, and the bottom line is a lot of people, a lot of innocent people are dying. On our side, on their side, doesn't really make much difference. People are dying. And I think that not having the wall it would be fine as long as there wasn't all the pressure from the cartel. So what are you going to do with the cartel? Are you going to go down there and, and stop the cartel? You can't. I mean, it's just not going to happen. We don't have an asylum agreement with Mexico, so that's a problem. Uh, I mean, there's just, I don't know. I think that if you're not going to have the wall, it's, it's just going to get worse and worse and worse. It's just, it's, it's nobody's fault other than the cartels. So unless that changes, you got to do something. I mean, it, it's it's sort of common sense. If there's an issue with getting legitimate Mexican citizens into the United States that they can work and support their family, and we can streamline that process, I'm all for it. But there's a lot of bad people coming across the border, and I don't think people at home realize that. How else can you put it? How else can you how else can you say that? Uh, you support somebody who's coming across the border trafficking a minor against their will perhaps carrying drugs that are going to go into your daughters into your sons into your relatives I, I just don't I don't understand it we need to do if we have laws for a reason if you don't like the law change the law that's it's a plain it's plain and simple as that and you know as, as much as I hate to say it the Mexican people I, I don't know at some point they have to take in control of their lives. I'll probably leave this whole commentary out because I know people are just going to flip when they hear it, but you got to be down here to really see it, to understand it. It's just, it's a very, very complicated issue. And I think for us to be calling each other snowflakes or us to be calling each other tr Trump lovers and this and that, it's not very constructive. Not at all. These people are not they're not political down here for Christ's sakes. They're trying to do a fucking job. You know, and all we're doing is they're berating each other because of what we believe in. And get real. Anyway, that's the video for today. I'll give you an update as I come. Uh, but uh, I think we pretty much touched on most of it. So next time, take care.